Good morning and a very warm welcome to the EPC Friday update, our weekly look at the key developments on COVID-19 and the implications for Europe's economy, society, its global role and for European politics in general. My name is Jackie Davis, I'm a senior advisor to the European Policy Centre uh, and joining me as always this week are Yanis Emanoulidis, Director of Studies at the EPC and Fabian Zulig, Chief Executive of the European Policy Centre. And later on, we'll have a special guest joining us, EPC Senior Policy Analyst Karina Stratulat, who is head of its programme Europe on European Politics and Institutions. We're going to focus in the first half of today's update on what's been happening over the last week, notably in relation to the European Central Bank uh, and its role uh, in combating the COVID-19 crisis and dealing with some of the fallout. And we're going to talk about the latest developments, as always, in the Brexit negotiations. Then in the second half, with Corinna, we are going to focus on the prospects for the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, just housekeeping notes for those of you joining for the first time or using so many platforms you can't remember how they all work. Uh, this is a totally interactive discussion, as always, and twice during the session, I'll be coming out to all of you for your questions uh, once immediately after we've done uh, the latest developments, so ECB and Brexit, and then again uh, after the discussion on the Conference on the Future of Europe. Your microphones are muted. If you want to ask a question when I open up to the floor, click on the hand-shaped button on the right and I will unmute you. If you prefer to write your question, click on the enter a question button, write it and hit enter. And may I remind you, please, 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 not long essays with all your thoughts on the topic, just quick, sharp questions so I can see at a glance who your question is to and what it's about. Uh, just to say in advance, if we get a lot of questions or they're very detailed and we don't have time for them all, we will try to come back to you after the update and give you a written response. So let's turn first, uh, and Yanis, if I could turn to you first, on the European Central Bank. We saw this decision by the ECB to boost the size of its pandemic emergency purchase programme and extend it to at least June 2021. How significant is this? I think it is significant. Well, overall, we've seen that uh, the role of the ECB since the beginning of the, of the crisis has been significant. The fact that it reacted rather fast, um, 18th of March, we took the original decision on PEP. The fact that now they have now increased its volume, that they've indicated that they, it will run at least until the end of uh, June of 2021, is another signal that the ECB is there to do whatever it takes. And I think that this has been a very strong um, confidence bazooka, uh, which the ECB has given us, has given all of us. Um, because imagine if what would have happened if the ECB would not have come forward with the PEP, if they would not have been able to agree on such a program, I think the negative effects of that would have been huge. And now that they have increased the volume, that have extended it, I think they're showing that they're ready to do what it takes. And that, by the way, in case there's need for more, they will also do more. Can I just ask, though, um, they had enough firepower, apparently, to last them till at least October. Um, why have they done this now? Does this link uh, to the German Constitutional Court, to Karlsruhe? Are they trying to send some sort of message? Or does it link more, perhaps, to, you mentioned, uh, the whatever it takes. Uh, the ECB President Christine Lagarde was very strongly criticised at the start of the crisis for comments she made that impl implied they wouldn't do whatever it takes. Why now and why on such a scale? Because experts have not been predicting this. I think it uh, relates to all the reasons you were mentioning. Um, there were already before the uh, Katsuro ruling, some who were saying um, this uh, is not long enough, the end of the year. Um, the amount will not suffice. Um, people were witnessing um, how the ECB was already using PEP over the past weeks, past months, and were saying, if you uh, project that into the future, the 750 billion will not be enough. Um, and uh, you can assume um, that the economic uh, consequences of COVID-19 will not be overcome at the end of the year. So again, people were saying um, you need probably more. Um, so there were already pressures on the ECB 
um, to go further than they had already gone in March. And then came Karlsruhe, the Karlsruhe ruling, which I think was um, another reason why this came at this present point in time, to show that uh, PEP is here, PEP is here to stay, um, that uh, there is proportionality, that there are reasons uh, for PEP. Uh, and, in fact, and I think the fact that the ECB and uh, President Lagarde herself were so much indicating that there is proportionality, that there is necessity, yeah. that there is necessary in order to have a transmission mechanism in place working in terms of monetary policy. I think that was also a signal okay. to Katsua. We did our homework in the past and we'll continue to doing it in the future. Okay, before we move on to, to Brexit, just one other question, and that relates to the Eurogroup. There's been a mm -hmm. lot of criticism of the role of the Eurogroup and a sense that the ECB in part is acting so forcefully because there's a sense that the Eurogroup is not doing anything at all. We've now seen the resignation of its president, uh, Mario Centeno. Um, what do you think in terms of, of the future of the Eurogroup? We've even heard for calls for it to be abandoned. This is pointless, we don't need it. Or, Andrew Duff argued in a commentary published by the EPC this week, uh, what we need to do is we need to make uh, the commissioner uh, Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni, uh, the president of the group, he says the recovery fund is a nascent treasury and it needs a treasury secretary. Um, is the Eurogroup still fit for purpose? What do you think of the commissioner idea? Brief thoughts, if you would, and then we'll turn to Brexit. We definitely need the Eurogroup. At the same time, uh, there have been critical voices and there have been critical voices, especially with respect to more substantial reforms of economic and monetary union. We've seen a process which uh, started um, more than one and a half years ago to again try to reform economic and monetary union, and that didn't really lead anywhere. Uh, it needed the pressure from the, the current crisis to get things moving again. But that's not the fault of the Eurogroup at the end of the day. It's the fault of uh, the member states, of the member states' governments, of the heads of state and government who are not uh, ready to find an agreement, provide strategic guidance on the basis of which the Euro group can then do its work, take concrete decisions, uh, see how to implement the strategic decisions which need to be taken at the top level, at the level of the European heads of state and government. So to assume that it is the Euro group's fault, I think makes things too easy. Um, now, with respect to the future, I, there is a reason to argue that you need more of a structural reform, also with respect to his presidency. However, I don't see that there's a political will willingness to go in this direction. They will be using, they will be looking for someone to replace the current president from within the circle of finance ministers. We're not at a point, I think, where a commissioner, Gentiloni in this case, could assume that role. Okay. The system is not ready for that. Okay, thank you very much. Fabian, I don't know if you want to add anything uh, on, on that point before we move to Brexit. Um, just a, a very quick point on uh, the ECB. I think it's, despite Karlsruhe, it's still noteworthy uh, how little controversy this is actually generating, um, that the ECB continues to do what it needs to do, uh, but that we don't have the same kind of discussions uh, as we had during the Euro crisis. Uh, I think that's a good sign. I think there's a recognition that uh, this has to be done. Um, so we'll need to find a way um, of dealing with uh, the Karlsruhe verdict. Uh, but overall, there's a broad acceptance uh, that the ECB has to play this role. OK, let us turn to the developments in Brexit. And yesterday, uh, we saw a couple of significant announcements, the first being we now have a date. Uh, for the meeting between Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, and the heads of the Commission, Council uh, and Parliament. That is next Monday, the 15th. And we also heard an announcement about what they called about an intensified timetable for the talks. The idea being, uh, COVID permitting, five weeks of intensive face-to-face -face talks. Um, this led people to suggest, despite a lot of negative mood music, at the end of last week, at the end of the last round of negotiations, when Michel Barnier said no substantive progress has been made at all since we began, there was a suggestion this might be a cause for more optimism. Also, a suggestion from the UK side that this was a victory for the British government, uh, getting this intensification. Your reaction to both, is it significant? Does it make you more optimistic? And is it a victory? Well, um, I don't think you would expect me to become more optimistic. Um, I, I think it is not significant. Um, I think it was always going to come. Uh, we knew that there had to be a date 
um, where this meeting takes place. It had to be before the end of June, um, but there's still a major question of what is the content uh, of that meeting? Uh, what can you actually achieve? Because the key decision which needed to be taken before the end of June was the question of extension of transition. Uh, and there is no movement on that from the UK government, even though the signalling from the EU have become even stronger that it would make sense uh, to have an extension. Uh, so I would not expect very much from the meeting uh, on Monday. Um, I think when it comes to the intensified uh, discussions, um, to some extent we are only going back to where we should have been in any case, um, given that uh, we didn't have the face-to-face -face meetings which are normal uh, in a negotiation of this nature. Um, yes, uh, it will uh, be useful to try to push uh, the negotiations, but the key question remains, is there any movement on the substantive issues? And for the moment, uh, there is no change in, on the substantive issues. Okay. That and led to my next question. Uh, on, on the victory point, um, Oh, if yes. the UK government wants to portray this as a vic victory, then let them. Um, but in reality, uh, neither side at this stage wants to signal that they are not trying their hardest to get to a deal. Um, so this is all about positioning. This is all about showing that um, both sides are still approaching this constructively, that both sides are still claiming to want a deal. But mm. on the substance, we're making no progress. So avoiding uh, at this stage having the finger of blame pointing at them for not trying. Uh, just in terms of you said there's no movement uh, and Barnier said there was no movement. But nevertheless, we have seen speculation again uh, in the UK that Barnier is willing to move on the level playing field issue. We've also seen uh, speculation that in some way he is being held, how can I put it, hostage uh, by the member states, that he now wants to give ground on the level playing field, he wants to give ground on fisheries, he knows that the EU position is untenable, uh, but he needs a change in mandate. Um, and so it's fascinating to me that we've gone from everyone in the withdrawal agreement negotiation saying the member states want to be nice to us, but Mr. Barnier is being mean. Now it's the other way around. Mr. Barnier would love to be nice to us and it's the member states making it impossible. Uh, he said he doesn't need a change of mandate. Um, what is your reaction to that British interpretation being put on his position? Well, it continues a very long line of British misinterpretation of what is happening on the EU side. Um, the Barnier does not need a new mandate. His mandate covers what the member states want. Uh, there is continuous contact between uh, the member states and the negotiation team on the EU side. Uh, so the idea that there are major differences uh, between the way this is seen in the capitals and in Brussels uh, is simply not true. Um, I think what is true is that, as in any negotiation, of course, uh, there is room for compromise on certain issues. And what Barnier was signaling, uh, in my view, is to say that, um, yes, we will have to make progress uh, on issues such as level playing field, but we need to find a landing zone which both sides can get to. Um, but the idea that this is in some way um, going to break the principles of the EU, the red lines of the negotiation, which are encapsulated in the mandate, um, I think is fanciful. And that's not going to happen uh, because it's not in the domestic interest of the EU 27 um, to deviate from this. Uh, there are strong interests here. Um, and in one sense, uh, yes, the UK is right. Barnier should be their best friend uh, because in a negotiation like that, you need someone on the EU side who pulls together the different positions, who makes sure that there's some arbitration between the different interests which are there. But that does not mean that there's disunity. Differences in interest do not mean disunity. They just mean that we have to have a negotiation uh, and for the moment, uh, the UK is still refusing to engage on some of the really difficult bits, the overall governance, uh, fisheries, level playing field. Um, and these are the ones uh, which will have to be resolved. Um, otherwise, there will not be a deal. Mm. Yanis, um, Fabian, characteristically pessimistic. Um, he has long been pessimistic and sees no reason at this stage 
to change his view. Uh, do you see any more grounds for optimism at this stage? I must say that I don't. Um, I see that um, on the UK side, um, there is no readiness to move. I think that what we're hearing that the negotiations are not really progressing is correct. I actually believe that, according to what uh, Fabian was saying, that uh, Bani is the best friend of the UK on the side of the 27. He would be ready, he would be willing um, for this to progress. Um, but the member states are increasingly annoyed. Um, we've seen this uh, developing over weeks, over months. And I think that we want to see even more of an intensification of the EU 27 not being ready, uh, being annoyed about how London is dealing with the issues. Um, and now uh, the EU 27 will be dealing with its own issues, with the MFF, uh, with, um, with the recovery instrument. Uh, I think that uh, the remaining parts of June and July will be um, monopolized politically by this. So the UK is becoming more a source of annoyance than it had already been, which makes it even more difficult uh, if, on, if in London there is no readiness to find at least a compromises, but rather the contrary. Okay. Looking beyond Monday's meeting uh, and to the next few months, um, what's going to happen? We have apparently an October 31st deadline for agreeing a full legal text. Uh, you published, you co-authored Fabian, uh, a discussion paper published by the EPC yesterday on the need to extend the transition period. Uh, and you talked about the most legally sound solution being a mixed agreement, but that has its problems in terms of ratification and so on. Um, where do we go from here? And I have a specific question already coming in uh, from John Kerr about, um, do we expect the EU's financial services equivalence decisions to be announced this month? So basically, where do we go? What happens next, apart from the intensification of the talks? I think there is now a recognition um, that we are not going to make uh, sufficient progress before the summer. Um, I think that is clear now. Um, there was, when these uh, talks started, the hope um, that uh, certainly some of the, the key issues would have been cleared up by now. Um, and now we have this new deadline of October. Um, which in some ways um, is being put as an absolute deadline uh, mm -hmm. because the idea here is unless we have a legal text um, it becomes impossible to ratify. Now all of that has to be seen in the context uh, of uh, the transition period ending uh, on uh, the 31st of December um, unless there is an extension um, and as you've said the problem with the extension is um, the the best um, and the most sound way of doing it is before the end of June. Uh, anything beyond that becomes highly uncertain, much more difficult legally and economically, uh, which also would uh, encounter ratification problems uh, if we are going down the route of a mixed agreement. So we are in a position where uh, what we're facing essentially are two scenarios. Uh, one scenario is um, that we will not make progress um, and that by uh, autumn this will become clear and then we're heading towards a no-deal Brexit. Um, or um, there is a recognition on the UK side uh, that progress has to happen, that a deal has to happen, in which case we will need to see some major U-turns and um, some um, communication acrobatics um, to try to justify those. Um, how we play this now in terms of equivalence, in terms of the decisions which should have been taken by now, uh, we also have the fisheries uh, decision in the background which should have been taken by the end of June. Um, I think what um, the Commission is going to try to do is to be as accommodating as possible, again to signal that uh, we don't want the talks to, to fail, um, but it's going to be very difficult um, to maintain that if there isn't more willingness from the UK. Okay, um, there is, I mean, and all of this against the backdrop, Tillman Cook for saying, what about the dramatic 20% plus hit on the UK's economy reported in today's news uh, for April in view, and he's linking this to the prolongation question. It seems, that the government, British government, uh, now believes um, that, well, relative to the impact of COVID-19, the impact of a no-deal Brexit wouldn't be that serious, and indeed it might be a 
some cynics suggesting a cover to do this without getting the 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 uh, hit back, as it were, uh, from having done this. I mean, it doesn't seem nothing on the economic front, nothing in relation to COVID-19 seems to be changing the government's position. Uh, it doesn't look like it. And um, we are back to uh, the old maxim that um, Brexit is not about economic rationale. It is about politics. It's about ideology to some yeah. extent. Um, and uh, what we have now is a very clear sign um, that uh, this economic crisis is hitting the UK very, very hard, according to some of the figures, harder than anywhere else, um, which I, th I think is remarkable. Um, and contrary to some of the things which are being said, um, it is not going uh, to be the case that uh, the effect of Brexit somehow gets lost within uh, the, the COVID uh, effect. What we're going to see is that uh, for many companies, it will get even more difficult. Yeah. If you have the uncertainty over your main export market, um, then uh, that could well be uh, the final straw, uh, which leads to more uh, redundancies, more bankruptcies. Okay. Uh, we might have a number of location decisions where companies will not go back into activity in the UK uh, because they are seeing that uh, they will no longer be access to the single market. Um, but what might be true, and maybe that is what some of the ARC Bre Brexiteers are banking on, is that you might not be able to see these effects as clearly. Um, so it could be a way of trying to hide the real effects of Brexit, sure. which would be a very cynical way of looking at this. I also uh, I wonder myself, uh, because one of the remarkable things about COVID-19 is that supply chains have not been disrupted, uh, that we've kept the shops full, supplies have moved around Europe. Uh, Brexit, no deal Brexit, would hit that side. So it might look a little different to the sort of economic damage now, but let's take Two questions from the floor orally, if the technology works, and Yanis, then I'll come back to you as well. Martin, Alexoff, you are self-muted. If you could turn your mic on, I can give you the floor. Let me try once more. No, at the moment you're self-muted. John Palmer, you have the floor. John, are you there? John, I'm here. Hi there. Hear? You've just turned yourself on. I could hear you, and uh, then you turned yourself yeah, Sorry. Two very, two very quick uh, quick questions. There are reports that the British government is about to announce a unilateral decision that even after a no-deal Brexit at mm -hmm. the end of the year, they will keep open existing trade flows into the UK, although they accept that uh, controls uh, on the other end of the other side of the channel are, are uh, going to come into force. What real significance do you think this has for the psychology of the Brexit talk? And Thank the you. second question, if I may, um, could we ha have you any idea of the total resource stimulus to the uh, European Union economy coming from all the different quarters that are now uh, uh, forecasting stimulus as a proportion of GDP and any figure for the potential net resource transfer from richer to poorer EU countries. Thank so you. you mean putting together MFF, Recovery Fund, ECB, exactly. EIB, all of that, do we know exactly. what, how big it is. Let's take the other question before we try to answer that. Thank you, John. Uh, Martin, let's see if we can unmute you now. Mm. Martin, any joy? Not at the moment. Okay, let's take John's two questions and then I'll keep trying to open Martin's mic. Uh, so uh, this idea that, that the UK won't impose checks and so on will keep the trade flows going, whatever happens, are you likely to reciprocate, Fabian? Um, in a word, no. Um, the EU has um, not only uh, the wish, but also the legal obligation to protect its single market. Um, we uh, have to be able to check whatever goods uh, come into the single market, uh, uh, these have to perform uh, according to European rules. Um, so the idea that uh, somehow this can be suspended um, for a partner is just uh, fanciful. This is not going to happen. Um, what might be the case is that the UK opens its borders completely uh, to anything coming from the European Union but that bears a lot of risks. Um, that uh, 
uh, we could be in a situation where things are being exported to the UK, uh, which are not fulfilling uh, the standards which we think. Um, I, I think this is uh, frankly an admission of failure on the UK government side uh, because uh, there was a lot of talk uh, at the beginning of the year about the need uh, to protect uh, the UK single market to make sure uh, that products are checked when they come into the UK. Now there's an admittance that um, this will not be possible because the UK will not be ready to do so. Um, but unfortunately, I think it will change very little uh, about the trajectory. Um, there doesn't seem to be any traction. Um, and it has to be said that at the moment, at least, um, uh, I think the main opposition party in the UK is still not uh, pushing the government uh, strong enough on some of these inconsistencies. Um, uh, and that means, um, in some ways, the government is getting away with things. Thank you. Yanis, on this question, I saw you scribbling furiously. I don't know whether you were doing the math. Yes. <laughs> but the question about the total resource stimulus, how much is all of it worth? And do we know yet, can we calculate a figure on the net resource transfer that we may be looking at? Well, with respect to the overall figures, uh, obviously we do not know yet because we're far away from having an agreement among the EU27. We will have the video European conference uh, on the uh, European Council meeting, sorry, on the 19th of June. That will be a first um, uh, indication of the direction which we're going. Then we're going to probably have a July European Council where there will be meeting. Um, so we're far away from an agreement yet. However, what we have on the table is what we know is the 540 billion which they have agreed the SURE program, on the EIB, on the ESM loans potentially to be used, which we do not know whether member states will be using it. Uh, we have the 750 billion proposal of the European Commission, 500 in uh, grants for 250 in loans for the um, uh, recovery instrument. Again, the member states still need to agree to that proposal. And then you have the 1.1 billion MFF proposal on the table, which largely will remain unchanged to what we've had on the table already in February. But again, everything's linked to each other. The EU27 has to agree. So if you put all that together, that's close to 2.4 um, trillion. But then again, some parts of it are loans, some are grants, and there's also some wizardry, um, given that that there is some leverage which uh, wants to be, which is supposed to be achieved on the financial markets. So we have to see how that works out. And with respect to the um, uh, the net resources, um, well, with respect to transfers. Um, 500 billion of grants were included in the uh, in the recovery instrument proposal, but we do not know whether 500 it will be at the end. How much will go to whom? Uh, under which conditions will actually the hardest hit uh, countries will get most of that money? And then the question is also how will it be paid back? We know that the proposal of the Commission foresees that it shall be paid back in 2028 onwards until 2058. Um, so the world will be a different within these years and decades. Uh, so to make a promises of who will be paying back what at what time is almost impossible. Okay, David, a quick one if you would, because I want to move on to the conference on the future of Europe. Yeah, um, two very quick points. One is uh, what is still very unclear is the timing of this. Um, so we don't know when the stimulus is actually going to happen. Um, what we would really need to do is break it down by year by year, um, possibly month by month. Um, and that's uh, at the moment is, is not clear. The other point I just wanted to make is um, to come back to something we said before that we shouldn't lose sight of the state aid issue. A large amount of funding is flowing in the form of state aids um, and it's a very arguable whether this is actually a stimulus for the whole of Europe given that it is so much focused at the national level. Um, so I think it's something we really need to keep an eye on um, because in some ways at least in one country, Germany, um, these funds are very, very large um, and they will have a very, um, very strong impact, um, both on the recovery in Germany, uh, but also potentially distorting the level playing field within the European Union. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Martin, just uh, Martin Alexov, just to say you're still self-muted, so I cannot give you the mic. Uh, we will have another round of questions after we've discussed the Conference of Future of Europe. So if you still wanted to ask a question and you can find a way to unmute yourself, please do and I'll come back to you later. 
But let us turn our attention now to the conference on the future of Europe. Uh, and joining us for this discussion, I am delighted to welcome uh, EPC senior policy analyst Corina Stratelat, who is head of its European Politics and Institutions program. Uh, there she is, uh, like magic, the wonders of modern technology. Corina, a very warm welcome to you. Welcome to the weekly update. Um, you uh -huh. wrote in a paper right at the beginning of this crisis. You said the crisis had diverted attention from the conference, but reinforced its relevance. But there may be many people saying, how can it still be relevant right now when we're dealing with such an immediate crisis? Is this really the time to talk about the long-term future? Oh, you're, you're muted. You are still muted. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Away you go. <laughs> uh, Jackie, thank you for the question and the opportunity to contribute to, uh, to the famous weekly update by the EPC. Um, I, why is the conference relevant now? Well, I would say for, for two reasons. Uh, first, because you cannot um, run away forever from your structural problems. You can try, you can even succeed for a while, but fundamental challenges will always find a way to, uh, to catch up with you. And the thing is that while you might think that you are buying time uh, with quick fixes, in fact, you risk that the next time your deep uh, cracks resurface, and, and, and they always do, you might uh, be in a weaker position than last time to deal with them. The poly crisis of the past decade, for example, already tested the union with some basic questions about how it can function and, and what concepts like solidarity or like borders really mean. Uh, now, with the coronavirus, you have a culmination of all previous crises, and the impact promises to be devastating. The economy, the single market, Schengen, liberal democracy, all took a particularly hard hit now. So, if at present, again, the answer is to try to run faster than your problems um, and come up with band-aid solutions, well, okay, you can do that, but rest assured that the new crisis will show up in the future to remind us again of what has to be done. And what has to be done is that we have to face our fears and decide that we will do whatever it takes, and I mean whatever it takes, to get in better shape. Be open to challenge what we know, how we do things, and be willing to change if we need to. And what better way to engage in such a transformative process than with the Conference on the Future of Europe initiative, which, by the way, was announced prior to the COVID-19 crisis uh, as a two-year process of inclusive discussions in innovative format about key European issues. So let's stop that. There is plenty to talk about. Okay, then hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I just want to, to ask you, as you say, this was all going to happen anyway, pre-crisis. You are agreeing very strongly there, and I'd like to get Fabian and Yanis's reaction in a moment to the relevance question. Um, but how do you think, if it has, the COVID crisis has impacted on what the conference will discuss, should discuss? What difference does it make to the agenda, not the fact of it, but the agenda? Right, but please allow me, uh, Jackie, to tell you my second reason why the conference is relevant now, and that is because, coincidentally, we are preparing for Germany to take over the presidency of the Council of the European Union in July, and Germany is a key member state, one of the two parts of the traditional engine of European integration, and a country which can undoubtedly command more authority than most other member states. So this presents a unique opportunity to get the ball rolling on a transformative process like the, the conference conference now. If someone can set this in motion, it's Germany. And they can also use the conference as a measure of the success of their presidency. So it's a win-win. Now, with uh, regards to, um, to the topics, I mean, um, well, according to, to, to the vice president, Suiza, uh, initially planned topics like climate change, like digital transformation, social justice, the Spitzen candidate system, and the transnational list for EP elections, will be downgraded now in importance, while issues like healthcare and the EU's response to the pandemic will take the central stage of the conference. And I think she's not wrong. I mean, uh, in the sense that the, the pre-crisis priorities still hold true, but given COVID-19, areas like economic, like health and foreign policy, like financial affairs, like democracy, have definitely moved into focus and should top the conference on the future of Europe agenda. Yet, 
we should be careful, I think, not to reduce the conference to the health, price, uh, health crisis or any other emergencies. Those are important and um, in some cases they may even prove quite transformative for the EU, but we don't need a conference to put out fires. The added value of the conference would be actually to offer a platform for all relevant health stakeholders to face their deepest fears uh, because we realize that we have got to, uh, to get to the bottom of this sooner rather than later. Uh, the point is not to have a conference for the sake of having a conference, but rather to create a safe place where we can think and decide collectively about how the union's remaking should look like. Uh, okay. A presence where nothing is off limits. Okay. So. Um, in that sense, there is so much to discuss uh, in the conference. Thank you. And you mentioned the German presidency. One more question before I come to, to Fabian and Yanis for now. Um, we do know Mikhail Roth, uh, the Minister for Europe, the German Minister for Europe, said at the end of last month that the Council was far away from a political consensus on the format and so on. He also said the Parliament had very high expectations and there needs to be an interinstitutional agreement to get started. So. You may be passionate about why it's so important and it's urgent and we need to get started under this presidency, but it looks as if they've really got their work cut out. What is dividing member states at the moment uh, and why? I mean, I think Miguel Roth was, was implying that those high expectations of the parliament would not be met. What's the sticking point and what does that mean for the timetable for starting it? Will the Germans be able to claim this as a success by December? Well, what divides them? Probably a lot of things. Again, I will mention uh, two which uh, stand out as uh, being particularly thorny. First, you have the leadership, that is who and which institutional personality should lead the conference. Uh, and second, whether the conference on the future of Europe should actually be open to treaty change or not. How do you bridge such differences? Well, you probably can't bridge them unless you are desperate enough to decide that you will do whatever it takes to get over this mess. Uh, and I, you cannot really get out of this vicious circle of debilitating crisis and, and stay ahead of the curve if from the start you are resisting the possibility that change might be necessary and if you are looking for leaders among people who will always give you the same answer to every question. We need reformists at the helm, uh, and, and these reformists are a special breed of individuals because they see opportunities where most of us see problems, they are ready to drop their rigid ideological mind frames and they are happy to engage in some serious soul searching and creative thinking. And I think this is the kind of people we need, but I'm afraid that I'm, or, or I'm not sure that the focus is on this criterion um, uh, right now at, uh, at present. When we can expect this to start? Well, probably at the earliest in September. However, many seem to want uh, um, to wait uh, for the pandemic to be over first before they can, the conference can be launched. As explained um, in, in, in my first um, answers, we are not buying time, we're only increasing risks and postponing the inevitable by waiting. Thank you. I want to come back on the process and how it might work, but um, uh, I want to come to Fabian and, and Yanis on this question. In terms of the relevance, a passionate plea there from Karina that this is more relevant than ever. Uh, but I'm wondering, A, do you agree with that? And secondly, in terms of political feasibility, she talked about and leaders facing their deepest fears and we need a special breed of individuals and forgive me for being cynical but do we have a breed of individual at the moment who's likely to be around that table who will indeed face their fears ask the tough questions and so on Yanis well if the pressure is strong enough you get the right people to be there that's a general remark I think with respect to the conference um, you've had a discussion already before COVID-19 broke out the crisis broke out. And there were people who were skeptical about the conference. They were arguing that it might at the end of the day only be a fig leaf or might create uh, expectations which are too high. So you have a lot of critical voices coming from different uh, parts of life and right? also political realism or, or idealism. However, I think that uh, the COVID-19 crisis is actually showing that the conference is more relevant. There are a lot of issues which now have come on the agenda which haven't been on the agenda. Uh, Corinna was already mentioning health. Obviously, this is now an issue which uh, before February and March we weren't discussing. I think in general, crisis uh, reaction mechanisms, also with respect to decision making in the EU, but also with respect to money. We went into this crisis in a very chaotic way. And I think there are some lessons which we need to learn from that, things we weren't thinking about before the crisis. 
practices. Um, or look at uh, what Fabian was mentioning earlier with respect to the single market and the distortions uh, which the single market is now subject to. Um, and that related also to Schengen. These were things which, well, people were thinking about, but they were not at the center of attention. Now they need to be. And the old issues, you need to put a new filter on them. Uh, when you look at uh, how we deal with the digital, how we deal with uh, issues related to uh, the Green Deal. You need to put the COVID-19 filters on these issues. So in terms of content, I think there is a relevance. The question is uh, whether things will be moved. And here we were already stuck in the council before uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, got started, and we're still stuck in the council. There is now pressure from some member states, including from Germany, but also from France, also from other countries, by the way, which will be holding the rotating presidency in 2021, who are probably the ones who are most eager to get things going. Um, but you obviously need consensus among the 27. Um, and the, the question of leadership, which Corina was already alluding to, is key here. Um, now, if you want to bridge consent, uh, differences between the member states, what you usually do is you fudge things. Um, so you, I think you will see some degree of fudging both with respect to the issues, the agenda, uh, and also with respect to the leadership. Um, there might be co-leadership models. Um, we will have to see what kind of competences that leadership of the conference will really have at its disposal. Where will the money lie? This is a, a, an important question. Um, but once the leadership question is decided in the council, which it, at least the council needs to have an idea of what it wants and then has to discuss with the other institutions, we get to the moment where we need the institu institutional agreement. That might happen faster than we think. Now, I'm not saying that it will, but it might happen faster than we think. I think that the Germans will be really pushing to get at least the Conference on the Future of Europe off the ground, to get it started. But then come all the procedural questions uh, with respect to... Well, come back to those, yes. if I might, in a moment. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions on this, you can raise your hand or write your question. Um, but, but Fabian, on this broad question, um, and, and I perhaps focus on the remark about the Parliament's high expectations, um, we talk a lot, and we'll come back to how it's going to work in the process, we talk less about outcomes. What will be done with whatever comes out of this conference? Is that, do you think, part of the problem at the moment with agreeing to go into it, that people don't know what will happen with the outcomes, and, and how would we make sure those outcomes are as concrete as possible? Uh, I think there's a couple of considerations here. Um, one is, um, if you don't want to hear the answers, don't ask the question. And I, I think um, the problem here is they have asked the question. Uh, it has been decided that there will be a conference. Um, so uh, the, the question is on the table um, and there will need to be some form of answer. Now, um, what that answer will look like, um, the, the expectations differ a lot and um, in some ways uh, the Parliament has taken quite a maximalist position. Um, it wants this to be uh, leading to a sufficient reform process. Um, member states are much more reluctant. Uh, the question of should there be treaty change or not uh, clearly is being answered differently uh, by the different actors. Um, but in some ways that is also part of the debate you're going to have to have. Uh, and you cannot avoid that debate. Um, uh, and the longer you try to avoid it, um, the more you're going to end up um, with also dissatisfaction among populations uh, because they are not going to see a process which is moving forward. Um, and here I think member states are particularly asked um, because you can criticize the parliament for being maximalist. Uh, but uh, I think we need to also ask from the member state, well, what is it they want? And it is not enough to simply say no to everything. Uh, you have to come up with an alternative. There might well be legitimate alternatives. Um, but for the moment, at least, uh, it seems to be much more about what they don't want rather than what they want. Um, my final point is just to say that I think what we all need to collectively avoid is that this becomes a tokenistic exercise um, where we are asking uh, people to invest their time, their effort, uh, their passion, their commitment, and then at the end uh, we simply move on. Uh, it's being put into a report, we all say that was very nice, and then nothing happens at all. If that happens, uh, it shows um, to many citizens once again 
that Europe doesn't really listen. Um, and I think that's exactly the wrong message which could come out of this process. Again, we have another question coming in about that question of timing and when we might get a joint declaration from the institutions. Karina, you were suggesting September is possible. Um, from your reading of the German presidency, you said this was an opportunity for them to claim a success by making progress. Do you think they attach as much importance to it as you do? Uh, and in terms of the process, if we can come back to that question, um, this is supposed to be a very inclusive process involving a very wide range of stakeholders, but it would start if it starts in the autumn under the most difficult of circumstances meeting virtually almost certainly uh we don't know when physical meetings will be possible um how can the process be devised to accommodate all of that and still have that meaningful involvement that is essential otherwise it will be dismissed as as, as little more than a pr stunt so first question about the german presidency and its priority and what that might do to the timings um and the second about the process how are we going to make this work Right, um, but I want to um, add something to what Yanis and Fabian have said first, and, and that's the fact that we shouldn't underestimate the process either, so and, and preempt the conclusion in, in a sense. I mean, of course, it is very important to have some concrete outcomes, and especially to close the feedback loop with the people beyond the mere a simple report. Um, that has been proven in the pre, uh, also as important in the previous exercises that we've done, for example, in the European citizens consultation process and I mean uh, it's for sure going to hold true uh, this time around as well however the process here is also important because if we do manage to um, uh, create a process that is inclusive of the different stakeholders at the different levels that really finds ways to give citizens a voice and an input and um, and and raise awareness to a greater about Europe to a greater extent that it's the case at the moment that in itself will have will also have added value so we shouldn't forget about that aspect now the conference is not included in official um uh, program of the of the German presidency and it is not yet clear how prominently it will um it will uh, rank on their agenda the council uh, the German council presidency at the moment has envisioned three phases to the to the issues that they will deal with the first one they want to get a deal on the MFF and the recovery fund and they want to do that by the end of July. Uh, the second phase is deal, dealing with the Brexit and the future of the EU-UK relations and that goal is set for October. Um, again um, perhaps uh, a bit optimistic uh, and then only in the third phase they plan to come to some of the other priorities uh, explicitly uh, they some of the issues that have been mentioned by officials from the german side have been migration the great uh, green deal digitalization the conference on the future of europe and the rule of law but that's in the third phase and we don't know how much this will be salient or not uh, in uh, uh, on their agenda now Coming to the um, to the issue of the process and the fact that uh, now we have a lot of restrictions on physical gatherings, so we have to to think a little bit outside of the of the box. I think that always when there is a will, there is uh, also a way. When we really want uh, uh, to, we humans we can prove very resourceful and creative. Uh, we're having this event today online, after all, and it's going well. And I would argue that the reason and fast adaptation and shift to online activity by so many organizations and businesses suggest that, that a lot can also be done without in-person contact. The restrictions on physical gatherings do not have to put the brakes on the conference process unless we allow them to. There are ways in which this can be organized to include a mix of physical and online events at different levels and with uh, various actors. In fact, um, I would argue that when it comes to involving citizens and reaching not only to more Europeans but also to the unusual suspects, this situation is possibly even stimulating. Uh, and, and I mean that in the sense that not only are we able to speak to more people if we use online tools, but because we are suddenly more aware of those we do not reach because they are offline, we have more incentives to actually make the effort of organizing uh, small and physical meetings 
on the ground in areas where marginalized groups are present and get their input and feedback. And the good news is that civil society is very active and willing to help in this process. We already have, for example, the Citizens Takeover Europe Alliance uh, includes some 45 CSOs from 10 different member states, which have self-initiated a citizens conference on the future of Europe. And they aim to bring citizens views through co-creation and deliberative uh, methods to the EU level. So there the is world. plenty of experience on methods of citizens consultation, many CSOs which stand ready to help with the implementation of the exercise on the ground. And we have European citizens which have repeatedly expressed that they want to be involved, they want to have a voice and they do care about Europe. So I, the real question is really whether we need to stop making excuses for ourselves. No, okay. Uh, I, I mean, I was merely asking simply because we know what a constraint it puts on relatively straightforward meetings of councils and so on. And now we're trying to do this wide exercise. Very interesting. This idea actually could make it easier, not harder. Uh, but Fabian, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I, I think uh, what we should reflect here is that this is a chance um, for significant innovation and that we can actually have um, for the first time a process which fully takes into account that technology has changed completely over the last years uh, and that you can do things online now uh, which you couldn't do beforehand. Um, for me this is a great opportunity. Uh, we can have something where um, for the first time a large number of citizens can become directly involved in the debate, can influence what happens. It has to be designed carefully um, but there is an opportunity here. There's an opportunity here um, to use the advances which have been made on translation in a way which actually connects people which otherwise would not be able to participate in this. There's a chance here to use new platforms to engage differently, to engage with young people uh, who are not engaging in the traditional uh, communication channels. Um, so I would actually put this stronger than Corinna. I would say this is a great opportunity um, to really design a process which is meaningful and which connects not only people to Brussels, but which connects people with each other. So we can get a cross-border connection, which otherwise wouldn't be possible if we don't use these new technologies. So for me, it's a great opportunity um, and it needs the political will to realize that. Yes, it will require some funding, but uh, in comparison to uh, what we need to organize these kind of processes, Doing it online not only opens new channels, not only opens new opportunities, but it's also far more cost effective than trying to bring everyone together physically. Okay, Yanis, so very upbeat here. It's not a challenge, it's an opportunity uh, having to do it this way. Do you share that view? I must say, I think it is a challenge. Uh, at the same time, it is a challenge that uh, can actually be met and you need to meet it in a different way than you would have envisaged to meet it uh, before COVID-19 started. Um, but let me say a couple of points. One is with respect to the German presidency. Um, there is no clear-cut position even in the German government. There are some who are skeptical about the conference, or some who are less. But it's interesting to see that Chancellor Merkel herself has been pushing to have more of a discussion on the future of Europe. And in that context, obviously, the, concept, the conference is to play a role. She was even using the, the word vision, which is interesting from her perspective. Um, so if, if she is going to invest herself politically in pushing this forward, I think we will see progress during the German presidency and thereafter, even though her, term is, her, her time is running out. Um, with the sex of the process, um, I think there are two things which you need to be always aware of when you think about the conference. One is the citizens' damage. This is what a lot of people have in mind. How can you engage citizens in these discussions about the future of Europe? But at the same time, there is the representative damage. There's the representatives of EU institutions, of the Commission, the Parliament, the Council, representatives of national parliaments, who also will have a role to play in this. And you need a strong buy-in from all these representatives who will be part of the representative uh, dimension of the conference. And you need to link these both, the representative dimension, the citizens dimension, with each other. In times of COVID-19, this is not easier, it's probably more difficult. Thank but that doesn't mean that it's impossible. Um, there is a need uh, uh, to do that, and all the online consultations will also be important with respect to defining the questions. I think it was uh, Corinne who said that it's important which questions we will be asking. 
Um, so if you limit the issues you want to discuss with in terms of themes, which is a key task which we still have ahead of us, because more is uh, uh, less is more in this case. If you agree on what the key issues are, is we should be dealing with, you can ask citizens of what are actually your major concerns, the major questions you want to be dealing with. Okay. That I can think, be done on law, for example. But it was Fabian actually who said, um, uh, if you don't want to hear an answer, don't ask the question. So I suspect some of the questions will be taken off the table because they don't want the answer. We have a comment from Andreas Peterson saying, how do we reconcile Europe, different European ways of life in the future of Europe? He, he suggests it'll be a compromise when nobody is happy. Um, I'll leave that just as a comment on the table. And one question from the floor, and then we need to draw some conclusions. Uh, Johannes Groebel, you have the floor. Hi, Johannes. Hello, um, thanks, Jackie. I have a question on uh, the council position and the possible uh, later interinstitutional agreement, um, specifically on something that Jan has mentioned before. Um, uh, Jan has said that uh, we might have to fudge things even further in the council. Now, um, the parliament has already stated repeatedly that the draft council positions that they saw are already too vague and uh, not ambitious enough. So, if the council fudges this position even more, uh, is there room at all for especially the parliament and the council to, to get to an interinstitutional agreement? Is there a landing zone? Thank you. It's going to have to be a quick answer. Uh, who would like to pick up on that? Yanis, can you, because it was a point you made? I can go back to it. I think um, the leadership question is important. Uh, and the leadership question of the conference here, you will have to find an agreement among the EU27. And if you find an agreement with respect to uh, how you can might configure from the perspective of the council, the leadership, and you might create uh, the idea of having co-leadership. So you might have one president of the conference on the future of Europe uh, and to vice presidents. And you will, do, you will, you will then um, find a way to make sure that different institutions play a certain role. You attribute to them certain competences. I think here you can fudge, but then you get together with the, with the Parliament okay. and the Commission. We're going to have to leave that issue for time, Bruno. We don't have time. The... Sorry. Yeah, hang on. We, we're almost out of time and I do want to end by asking you, I'm going to put you on the spot a bit. Uh, and Corinna, I'd like to start with you. I mean, you are so passionate about why this conference is so important, more important than ever, and why it needs to be brave and it needs to be bold. So that's what you want to see. But I want to ask you, uh, Fabian said, we have to avoid this being a tokenistic exercise. Your prediction now that at the end of this process, do you think it will have been a token tokenistic exercise? It raises expectations that will not be met. Or do you believe there is really potential for this to be a truly significant moment for Europe as it looks to the future? Uh, and you have one minute. What is your overall, are you optimistic or pessimistic about how important this will turn out to have been? Well, I want to be optimistic, of course. Um, but uh, just to say that um, the, the thing is that if we decide to engage with the, with this process, uh, it won't be a, um, uh, a wasted effort. Um, either way, it, as I said, whether in terms of process or of outcomes, it will get us further than where we are today. And I don't want you to think that I am calling, I am um, stressing on the importance of this conference for the conference in itself. I just appreciate it as an opportunity that we can, we have now and that we should grasp. Uh, the, the, the elements are all in play, place to create a perfect store. Now, how far we go with it, is, it's up to us. And I want to link my answer also to um, Johannes. Uh, um, sorry, we really don't have time to come back on that, Corinna. Just have a sentence, Jack. Just to say, we don't have to have all the answers and all and the agenda perfectly clear right now. We have to get it started. If the people get involved and if we're really having an inclusive process, this will organically develop. Okay, Fabian, uh, tokenistic exercise in the end or genuinely meaningful? How optimistic are you? I, I think we have a choice and I think this is the key question which has to go to Europe's political leadership. Do you want to use this as an opportunity to do something meaningful or are you going to try to um, just plaster over the differences, um, try to do something tokenistic and then hope no one pays any attention to it? Um, I think that's a choice. Um, we don't know uh, which direction it's going to go. 
Uh, certainly we can advocate for something meaningful, um, but in the end uh, it's a question which comes down to the leaders. I think what we will end up with is probably uh, something in the middle, um, mm -hmm. that uh, we are going to have the European compromise uh, where some useful things will come out of it, but maybe not uh, the more maximalist expectations. But as Karina was suggesting, that's not a bad thing. That would still be progress. That would still be uh, a significant step forward. Yanis, are you going to uh, let us leave on an optimistic, upbeat note or again on a pessimistic and downbeat one? No, I, I'm aware of all the problems related to the conference, but at the same time, I think that there's so much pressure that makes me optimistic that things will be moving. I think the key word I would be using is concrete. Will you have concrete discussions on concrete subjects? As I said, less is more. Will you have concrete results at the end of the process, which you will put into a concrete action plan of what needs to be done after the conference on the future of Europe? So concreteness is for me the key word. If at the end of the process, we have a five minute discussion about heads of state and government in the European Council, then it's not only not worth it, it will actually backfire because it will have created expectations that would have not been lived up for. So it needs to be concrete with respect to the process, the content and what happens thereafter. And on that note, Thank you so much, particularly to Corinna. Great to have you on the update. Thank you for your passion and your enthusiasm and also your very strong arguments. Let's hope that people are listening to you out there. Thank you, as always, uh, to Fabian and to Yanis. Uh, and thank you very much to all of you for joining and for sharing your questions and comments. Just a couple of things before we close. Things to watch out for next week. Uh, there will be a book published on the future EU-UK relationship. Uh, entitled Towards an Ambitious, Broad, Deep and Flexible EU-UK Relationship. Watch out for that. It's a multi-author book. Events. This afternoon, there is an event on Going Viral, Lessons from COVID, the COVID Crisis for Fighting Disinformation. On Monday, an event on Affordable and Decent Housing Solutions. On Tuesday, we turn to the circular economy's potential for fostering decent jobs. On Wednesday, we come back to the question of Towards Better health crisis management and the EU's role in global pandemics. Two events on Thursday, one on contact tracing apps and their role in fighting COVID, uh, and a broader one on are we on the right track in the response to COVID or should more be done? Friday morning, you won't see us on Friday morning, uh, there will be an event on COVID-19 and population movements. We will be back, in theory at least, at four o'clock next Friday afternoon, we've moved the time of the weekly update because EU leaders are due to have their teleconference summit that morning and finish before we start. So in theory, at four o'clock next Friday afternoon, we will be analysing the outcome of their discussions at this very important moment uh, for the EU. Watch this space. We'll keep you posted. Uh, we'll keep an eye on whether they change their plans and their timings. If not, uh, I will see Yanis and Fabian back here next Friday at four o'clock, and I hope many of you. And in the meantime, uh, bon weekend. Stay safe. Take care. Thank you all very much indeed. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks, Jackie.